I have had several single women express an interest to me in having a chainsaw at their disposal. While chainsaw ownership is typically viewed as primarily a male's domain, many single women are property owners and occasionally have more in the way of cutting needs than would be reasonable to satisfy with a regular handsaw. This video is intended to be a resource for these single women who have considered chainsaw use but have hesitated due to the various considerations involved. If you do decide to buy a chainsaw, please look at the safety tips and usage tips at the end of this video. Chainsaws come in several types and numerous sizes. So the first question that must be answered is, what do you intend to use the chainsaw for? If you are planning on using it exclusively around your yard for the occasional trimming of branches or the removal of small to medium trees, then your needs are best met by an electrical chainsaw with extension cords to your electrical outlets. These are the best choice for several reasons. First, they are the least expensive, ranging roughly in price from $50 to $200. Beware that the price is usually reflective of the power of the saw. With a weekly powered saw, you may have trouble getting through trunks, and you're more likely to get your chain pinched and held occasionally. Depending on your neighbor's sensitivity, another big advantage of an electric chainsaw is that they are much quieter than a gasoline-powered chainsaw. And you should never use a gasoline-powered chainsaw without hearing protection, and your risk of hearing damage with an electric chainsaw is much less. Another big advantage of an electric chainsaw is that you don't have to worry about gasoline or the fumes from its combustion. Because of that combustion, the muffler on a gasoline powered chainsaw can get very hot. Along those same lines, with an electric chainsaw, you don't have to worry about burning yourself. Because an electric chainsaw doesn't require a gas tank, starter arrangements, air intake, filters, or a muffler, the corded electric saws are significantly lighter. There are also some minor maintenance advantages with an electric chainsaw that we'll touch on later when we cover maintenance considerations. There are some disadvantages to using an electric chainsaw that relies on a power cord. How far can you get from the electrical outlet. You could of course buy several long extension cords, but if you do that you run the risk of a power drop over the distance. Also you could cause the cord to overheat, burn out, and possibly even start a fire. So if you do buy a cord you should limit it to one that's about a hundred feet long and only buy one that's got a good thick gauge to the wires. While there is one more big disadvantage to a corded electric chainsaw, let's take a look at another type of electric chainsaw, the cordless or battery powered electric chainsaw. These have the advantage that you're no longer tied to an electrical outlet. You could drive several miles and use the electric chainsaw there. In addition to losing the distance restriction, you no longer have to drag the electric cord, get it caught on things, and risk cutting the cord. The disadvantages of a cordless chainsaw start with the price. They tend to be significantly more expensive than a corded electric chainsaw and approach the price of a gasoline-powered chainsaw. Prices typically range from $100 to $400. The low end of that range will have a rather weak 20 volt power, while the high end of that range will have a respectable 80 volt power. Another disadvantage is that the battery charge will run out. 
with the corded saw you can just keep running but a battery will need to be recharged therefore it is advisable to buy two battery packs so that you can swap them out recharging and using and you can have a longer cutting session with the cordless chainsaw the price will reflect the power of the saw and the strength and charge duration of the battery. With a cheap battery, you may also see a longer time needed to recharge the battery. Note that the batteries will not hold their charge indefinitely. If you have not used a cordless saw for several months, you will probably need to charge up the battery before you take it out to do some work. Now for the potentially huge drawback of a corded electric chainsaw. Where I live, we get our power knocked out a couple of times a year and often have branches or trees down across our driveway or roads. If you have a corded electric chainsaw, it is simply an expensive shelf ornament. With a cordless electric chainsaw, your ability to use it is going to be dependent on how much charge it has left since the last time you charged it. With a gasoline powered chainsaw, however, you can crank it up and use it to clear your road or your driveways anytime you have a problem. If you don't want to buy a chainsaw, you will usually be able to rent one. However, the rental rates are usually pretty expensive. If you rent a chainsaw for a week, you'll probably be paying close to the cost of the saw. If you rent for just a day, you may be paying from a third to half the cost of the saw. There are three maintenance responsibilities that you should have as an owner. These are keeping the chain at an appropriate tension, keeping the chain lubricated, and keeping the teeth sharp. Most of your maintenance responsibilities can be explained right here. This is the typical chain arrangement for most saws. They have teeth, which have a very sharp edge, for cutting into the wood. They also have raker teeth, which help to speed away the small chips and slices of wood that the teeth have cut. They also serve as a depth gauge to make sure that the cutting teeth don't get too deep into the wood. On the bottom side of the chain are the keels that fit into the grooves in the bar. These keels keep the chain running where it is supposed to be and ensure that the teeth are cutting in the same plane that the bar is going through. If the chain is too, least, too loose the chain may wobble and in the worst case may even allow the chain to jump completely out of the groove and jam or even snap. One of your first maintenance responsibilities is to make sure that the chain is tight enough on the bar to keep the keels well seated in the grooves of the bar. You don't want it too tight or the chain will wear on the bar. Two obvious questions are, how do I adjust the tension in the chain, and how do I achieve a reasonable tension? Different manufacturers, particularly with electric saws, have come up with different ways to adjust the tension, so you may have to consult your owner's manual for your particular saw. We'll look at how it is done on this saw, which is the typical arrangement. Note that you can see that the chain is hanging somewhat loosely from the bar, a sure sign it needs to be tightened. The first step will be to loosen the connection of the bar to the body. Most chainsaws come with a tool which is a combination of a screwdriver and a wrench and is aptly called a scrinch. These two nuts hold the bar to the body. They should have been put on tightly and we will need to loosen them but not remove them. The safest way to loosen the nuts is to set the saw down on a surface you can lean over. Next, 
put the scrunch on one of the nuts so the handle is pointed someplace between level and 60 degrees up. Hold the handle of your saw with your left hand and push the screwdriver part of the scrunch straight down with your right hand. Both nuts need to be loosened enough so that the bar can wiggle. Next, we have to look for how to move the bar with respect to the saw. In most saws, this involves some type of a screw arrangement that, when turned, moves the bar out so that the chain can be tightened. On this old farm boss, the screw is recessed between the bar and the body. With a well-used chainsaw, the screw may have been buried under a covering of oily sawdust, so we may have to excavate for it with the screwdriver part of the scrunch. So there it is right there. With this MS-170, you can see again the tightening screw is located between the bar and the body of the saw. On this newer farm boss, the screw is located in the hole on the side. Once we have the screwdriver blade of the scrunch seated in the slot of the tightening screw, we can begin to turn the screw and move the bar away from the body. We watch the chain to see the sag disappearing. We check our progress by trying to lift the chain out of its groove. You should continue tightening the screw and lifting the chain until only about a third of the keel is exposed when you try to lift the chain. When you have achieved that tension, you need to lock it in by tightening the nuts that hold the bar to the body. This is one of those actions where you need to be careful about not cutting yourself on the chain as you will be pushing down close to it. Once you've properly tightened your chain, you shouldn't have to do that again for several uses. Rather than doing the tightening on any schedule, you should periodically check to see that the tension is still good. Giving a quick tug before each use is probably sufficient and a good idea. Whenever you have metal rubbing directly on metal, you will generate friction and heat. If extreme heat is generated, you can warp the metal, soften the metal, and wear away the metal. To prevent this, most machines use some form of lubrication to create a thin film between the two moving metal parts. With chainsaws, the chain races around the bar at high speeds and varying degrees of pressure are applied by the chain onto the bar. This requires lubrication. There are many kinds of lubricants, and different kinds of jobs require different lubricants. For oil-based lubricants, such as heavy greases, the need is for a heavy load that tends to be on the slow-moving side. For light, fast, low-load applications, such as a sewing machine, a light sewing machine oil is needed. For chainsaws, the oils have been specifically designed to meet the needs of a chain slipping on the bar. While most of the chainsaw oils are similar, you should buy the specific oil that has been made for your specific chainsaw. Fortunately, you don't have to apply the oil directly to the chain. Chainsaws have a reservoir which you fill as needed when running 
a trickle of oil runs from the reservoir and makes its way to the groove where it is whisked away to lubricate all the way around the bar. For this saw, there are two reservoirs. One is to hold the gasoline to run the engine. The other is to hold the oil to lubricate the bar and chain. The reservoir nearest the bar and chain is, logically, the one to hold the oil for the bar and chain. On this model, the plug is a flip-up handle that has been built in so you can unscrew the cap manually. On other models, the plug is unscrewed with the scrunch. When pouring oil into the reservoir, you want to be careful not to overfill it, as it can be quite messy to clean up. Not overfilling can be tricky, as the oil is dark and it is hard to see where the surface is. Additionally, oil is viscous enough so that it doesn't make a sound as it fills, so you can't listen to the sound of it getting close to full. Best practice is to pour in a bit, take a good look at the inside walls of the reservoir to check where the oil level has risen to, and add a bit more, repeating until the reservoir is around three quarters of an inch from the top. Make sure the top is securely fastened before moving the saw. I have had two spills with the flip-up plugs. There are actually two parts to keeping your teeth sharp. One of them is, don't do anything that will dull the teeth quickly. The second part is the tedious job of actually sharpening them. With proper use, you should be able to cut through wood for hours before the teeth begin to get dull. The metal that the teeth are made from is a lot stronger than the wood and will cut it easily. However, the minerals that sand and rock are made from are either as hard as or harder than the steel that the teeth are made from. Therefore, when the edge of the teeth encounter grains of sand, pebbles, or rocks, it will be the steel that deforms, potentially dulling your saw in just half a second. Therefore, you should try really, really hard to never let your moving chain touch the ground. I even get a bit nervous about cutting a trunk close to the ground, as the rain may have splattered grains of sand a few inches above ground to get caught in the crevices of the bark. If you're going to cut wood that's laid on the bare ground for a while, be aware that rain will splatter sand up onto the underside of the branch or log and this could really dull your teeth quickly if you're trying to go with the chain going into the wood because the wood will back the grains of sand and that will allow them to be held in place and really dull the teeth quickly. What you should do is cut so that your chain is moving out of the wood when it encounters the sand. That way the sand won't be backed and will just get knocked off. In normal usage, the teeth will dull slowly and uniformly. As your teeth dull, you will notice that it takes longer to cut through the same amount of wood. Also, you may notice that the sawdust being generated has a lot of dust-sized pieces of sawdust. With a properly sharpened saw, you should get mostly flakes. 
A dull saw may still cut a straight curve, but it will be slow. However, if your moving chainsaw encounters a rock, such as this one, you may only damage one side of your teeth. Let's say you dull the right side of your chain. The left side of the chain will still cut normally, while the right side will make slower progress. If you are cutting through a thick piece of wood, the left side of the chain will cut deeper, getting ahead of the right side. This causes the chain to try to pivot towards the right, producing a cut that curves to the right. If the curvature is bad enough, the bar will not be able to follow the chain down the curved surface of the kerf, and you will not be able to get through the wood. If you notice that your saw is making curved surfaces, that is a sure sign that your chain has become dulled on one side. The degree of curve can give you an idea of just how much sharpening you will have to do. Before we get into how to sharpen your chainsaw, we need to discuss this feature here. This is a very important safety feature called the chain break. While rare, there are a number of situations where you could be cutting and your spinning saw makes contact with an object. That saw can grab and kick back up towards you. This usually happens so quickly that you don't have a chance to react to it and it can be a very strong movement. You should always wear a helmet for that reason but also this safety feature comes into play in a big way. When the saw is spinning it moves easily around there but if it kicks back it moves rather quickly and violently and as a result it throws this chain guard against your hand and that locks the chain instantly. So even though the saw may end up making it to your head, it will no longer be spinning. You can disengage it by simply pulling back towards the body of the saw. So you should never let this get damaged and uh, always keep it functional. After you finish a cut and get ready to move to a new position, the best safety practice is to set your chain brake just a little flick of your wrist like that. Then you can move, set your chainsaw blade or set your bar down on the wood pull the brake back to release it, lift it a little bit, start the saw, and then cut through. You never know when that simple act of stepping could lead you to fall. You could be tripped by a vine, you could step into a hole, you might be scared by a snake, uh, you might slip on wet grass. So you don't know when you might lose your balance and end up falling. The natural reaction when you lose your balance is to try and grab. And if you're holding onto the trigger of your saw and you don't have the uh, chain brake engaged, then grabbing is going to set the blade into high revs and you may either fall on that spinning chain or it may fall on you. So again, best practice is always to just set that break with a simple flick of the wrist before moving around. So back to sharpening the saw. In many locations you should be able to find a saw sharpening service that can do the job for you. However, if you want to save some money it's fairly easy to do the job yourself. At a minimum you will need two things. A vise to hold the bar of your chainsaw and a round file that is of the correct diameter. It's also a wise idea to have a good pair of thick leather gloves. Not mandatory, but a good idea. 
These round files only cost about $3 a piece, less if you buy them in a large pack. I have five different saws and they take three different diameters of files. Looking at the saws side by side, you can see that the teeth on the three chains are of different sizes. These smaller saws take a 5 32 inch diameter file. The mid-sized saws take a 3 16 inch diameter file, while this large saw takes a 13 64 inch diameter file. This illustration, shot at about a 30 degree angle to the bar, illustrates an ideal tooth profile. A key to efficient cutting is the angle of the cutting edge. This one illustrates how a file of the proper diameter can maintain the proper cutting edge on the tooth as it is filed back. If too large a file diameter is used, the cutting edge will be too blunt and the tooth will be trying to rip more than slice the wood. If too small a diameter file is used, the edge will be undercut and the edge will be weakly supported, allowing it to overheat and bend. It is important that you use the right diameter of file for the chain that is on your bar. Regardless of what chain you originally put on your bar, it is possible that you could buy a different chain that requires a different file size. When you do buy a chain, keep a record of what file diameter you need to file that particular chain. Now to do the actual sharpening, the first thing you'll want to do is fasten your bar into your vise. But before you try to do that, what you should do is make sure that you've narrowed the vise to approximately the width that is needed to fasten in the bar. Then you can set it in and by bending against it um, you will be able to hold it in and be hands free. Then you take the uh, vise with your free hand and you go ahead and clamp it in. It's very important that you not clamp on the chain itself uh, as you could damage it, uh, make it so that these links don't uh, rotate freely as they go around the nose. And you don't want to get too close because you could also uh, collapse the uh, sides of the groove that the keels run in. So you want the bar to be right um, in the middle. Um, you want the vise above the bottom chain and below the top chain. If your vise happens to be one that has flat faces, such as this record vise, you have an additional problem. Now you don't want the uh, chain to get pinched between the jaws. So one easy solution is to make a couple of sticks with some brads nailed into them to hold them at the right elevation. A pair of brads will go on either side of the, uh, the bar. So we take our chainsaw, put it in at about the right height, set in one of the blocks, set the other block in behind it, and with that about the right height, we then go ahead and fasten the vise. And now the, uh, the chain is still free to rotate while the bar is held tightly by the blocks. Since you should always be pushing your file so it is moving off rather than towards the sharp edge, you will usually only be able to file the right facing teeth from the right side of the bar and the left facing teeth from the left side of the bar. You will need to reverse the saw in the vise so that you can do the left facing teeth from the left side of the bar. When you run the file against the teeth you will actually want to be exerting enough force so that you're removing some metal from the teeth. Since you're exerting force on that, you could actually cause the chain to rotate 
and you don't want that. You want it to be held in place. So that's where the chain break becomes important. Now your chain is locked and can't move so you can do your filing without it uh, moving around on you. After you've sharpened several teeth then you pull back on the chain break to release it and then you can rotate to expose a set of teeth that haven't been sharpened, reset the break and then do those. You have to go all the way around, um, catch all of them. Um, it's fairly easy with a little bit of experience to be able to look at the shininess of the uh, throat and see whether or not you've sharpened it and you only want to do the ones that you haven't sharpened yet. If you have problems with it you can mark it. On this particular saw there's a little bit of green painted on the side of one of the links. It came that way but if you want to start there then when you see that again you know you've gone all the way around. Another way to do it some people take a black magic marker and uh, uh, just sort of mark the top of the tooth so they can see that when it comes around. Since you're trying to make the teeth sharp enough to cut wood, it's obvious the teeth could also cut you. So you should take at least one safety measure. And that is when you file, don't uh, do like this. Have your, t have your finger under the file so that if you slip, your finger is hitting the bar rather than slicing over the top and getting uh, injured on the teeth. The other thing obviously is good thing to wear gloves. They may not prevent the teeth from getting through the gloves um, but it will certainly reduce the injury to your hand if that does happen. For sharpening a normally dulled saw you should only need about two or three swipes per tooth. However, if you have struck a rock or somehow damaged your teeth on one side, it may take five or six swipes to get past the dulled area. And this is an important point to remember. Even if just one side of your saw is dull, it's very important that you do an equal number of swipes on the teeth on both sides. You have to get them to wear down equally. The top surface of each tooth has a gradual downward slope, so as you file a tooth back, it also gets shorter. You don't want the teeth on one side getting shorter than the teeth on the other side or you'll have the same problem with your kerf curving on you. Earlier we saw that there are two kinds of teeth on a chain, the cutting teeth and the raker teeth. You can see that the rakers are not as tall as the cutters. The difference determines the depth of cut. If the depth of cut is too great, the cutters will be trying to remove too much wood on each pass and your saw may just stop as it may not have the power to pull the teeth through wood that thick. If the depth of cut is too small, the teeth won't be removing much wood on each pass and your cutting will be slow. Over the long term, you should run into this problem as the cutting teeth get a bit shorter each time you sharpen them back. If your saw doesn't seem to be removing much wood, this could be misinterpreted as being due to the teeth being dull. If so, sharpening the cutting teeth will only make the problem worse. The solution to this is to use a flat file to file down the height of the rakers. Most manufacturers sell a little kit that contains a flat file and, among other things, a gauge so that you can judge the correct height for the rakers. The way to use this gauge is to set it on top of the teeth, on top of the cutter teeth, and then you can check to see whether this raker tooth is sticking out above the surface of the guide. If it is, the correct way to do this is to file 
the raker down. Um, there are two ways to do it. That's the correct way. The way I like to do it is to check to see whether it needs to be filed and then very carefully file at an angle and then at a flat and uh, approaching at an angle you can cut into the corner easily and then you're sort of chasing a corner around. The issue is you have to be very careful that you don't slip sideways and dull the, uh, um, the cutting tooth. But the guide, the way you use it, makes sure that you can't damage the uh, cutting tooth. The problem is that eventually, after you've used it a while, you've actually filed down the guide and you're no longer getting an accurate uh, depth. You've actually changed the, uh, the depth of the cut. If you've hit a rock badly, one round of sharpening may not be sufficient. The best way to check to see if your sharpening has been adequate is to try to cut through a fairly thick log. If your saw is still cutting a curved kerf, then you need to do more sharpening. And it's important, again, that you balance the amount of sharpening done for the teeth in each direction. If you don't do a lot of cutting and don't try repeatedly to cut rocks, the chain should last you for years. If you do have to replace it, uh, the replacement chain for this saw is just $30. The more or less modern chainsaw has been around for about 80 years. During that time, the teeth have not changed significantly. However, recently, a new design for the teeth has become readily available. The teeth are much taller and are sharpened from the top down rather than from the front to the back. The big draw of the design is that the teeth can be sharpened simply by fastening a sharpening attachment to the front of the bar and briefly running the teeth against it to sharpen them. This eliminates the need for the tedious sharpening of the individual teeth. While very convenient, I have not heard a verdict on how long the teeth will last. Certainly, if the chain is run for too long against the grindstone, the teeth could be ground away quickly. Note that the arrangement requires three components. A grinding sleeve that fits onto the end of a special bar and requires a special chain. These three components can be brought to fit a growing number of common types of chainsaws, regardless of what type of bar and chain originally came with your saw. If you've already decided that you don't want a gasoline-powered chainsaw, you can skip through the next sections and get to some important safety tips and some usage tips that you should see. Gasoline-powered chainsaws come in a wide variety of sizes and a correspondingly wide variety of prices. The biggest saws have powerful engines and are designed for cutting down huge trees. The Steel 880, for instance, weighs more than 22 pounds without the bar and can accommodate a bar almost 5 feet long. With that bar and chain, another 11 pounds of very unwieldy weight is added. Such a monster saw currently costs over $2,000. Down at the homeowner's range, there are a lot of much more reasonable options. The power head for this MS-170 only weighs 8.5 pounds, and the 16-inch bar can handle some fairly large trees. In mid-2020, this combination was advertised for $180. I use this primarily for removing limbs from downed trees, a process known as bucking. I can handle up to a 15-inch log, but it does require some patience. When I have to cut through wood over a foot in diameter, I usually switch to my mid-sized saw. This MS-271 weighs 14 and a half pounds and comes with a 20-inch bar. 
The combination is advertised currently for around $420. So the power and size do come at a price. However, the extra power lets you get through big wood much quicker. Before we cover anything else about gasoline powered chainsaws, if you are considering buying one, you must be able to start it. This does come down to a strength issue. What you must be able to do is pull this starter cord several times in a row. With a relatively small saw like this, the pull is relatively easy, and most women should be able to do that. Several important things happen when you pull this cord. There's magnets on a rotor, and there's magnets around that that are stationary. If you took high school physics, you remember that you may remember that when you pull one magnet through another magnet field, the result is that an electric charge is created. That electric charge travels to the spark plug, the spark plug ignites and sets off the gasoline in the engine. The engine drives the uh, magnets and creates another spark. So it's a self-perpetuating process. So one of the very important things you do when you pull this cord is that you're actually creating electricity and that is work. The other thing you're doing is waking up the sleeping engine. Before you pull the cord, the oil is cold and a little bit sluggish. But once the chainsaw is running, everything gets hot and the oil is designed to work best for a hot condition. When it's cold, it sort of sticks the parts together a little bit. So one of the things you're doing is overcoming that initial stickiness that requires work. The other thing you're doing is you're dealing with the mass of the piston and trying to get that moving. As the size of the saw gets progressively larger, the size of the pistons also gets progressively larger. That increases the amount of surface that the oil is sticking together and that you have to overcome. I find this small saw pretty easy to start. This mid-size saw requires a bit more effort, but this big saw is a real bear. If you go to a dealer to evaluate a gas-powered saw, one of the things you should do is ask them to let you perform a cold start. Ask them to bring the saw to you gassed and oiled up, but not started. You need to be able to do a cold start. If they warm it up for you, it will be easier to start. And they will not be there when a windstorm has knocked a tree down across your driveway. There are two approved methods for starting a chainsaw. With a small to medium sized saw, you can take the rear handle, brace it under your thigh, hold the top handle with your left hand, Grab the starter cord and pull vigorously several times. This places the teeth on the opposite side of the body from you. The other way is to set the saw on the ground. Place your foot on the rear handle like that. Grab hold of the top handle. Pull the cord gently until you feel it engage and then pull the cord hard several times. If you're not able to do that, that's not the right saw for you. Taking a look at this dust-covered saw, we'll discuss how the thing actually works. Key to its operation is that inside of it there's essentially a can that has very smooth walls, thick, strong walls. That's the combustion chamber. Inside of that, a piston goes up and down. And that movement up and down does a lot of the powering of the functions of the saw. When it goes down, it sucks in air through a tiny little port at the top. The air comes in through this filter, goes down inside, 
and then before it en enters the combustion chamber there's a little butterfly valve on the uh, cha on the channel that can close or open to let the air in. When you push this lever down, that butter butterfly valve closes and prevents air from flowing in. At the same time, our gasoline chamber is down here, and when the piston pulls down, it sucks a tiny bit of that gasoline in, and the gasoline and the air mix to form a fine mist of gasoline inside the top of the can. The circular motion on the rotor here gets the uh, electrical charge to travel up to this spark plug. There is a gap in the spark plug where the electricity has to jump through the air from one side of the spark plug to the prong on the spark plug and that creates an open air spark and that spark ignites the mist of gasoline. Then the uh, gasoline as the piston has come back in is ignited and forces the piston back down and in that process of forcing more fuel and gas are brought in. When the explosion occurs inside of that can and drives the piston down once it's in the down position, the gases get ejected out from the bottom of that chamber and they pass through the muffler and out into the air. When you're trying to start the engine, it's important that you limit the air coming in because if you don't limit the air coming in, with each pull, air is drawn in and at the bottom of the stroke, air is expelled and with the expelled air will be some of that gasoline mist that you've blown in and so you won't be able to establish a high enough concentration of gasoline mist to uh, start the saw going. So you have to restrict the air by pushing this lever down and turning the butterfly valve to prevent air from entering. The process of preventing the air in is known as choking. So this is what engages the choke. As you pull the starter cord and inject more and more gasoline mist into the combustion chamber, you'll reach a point where the spark that's being generated each time encounters a mixture that has enough gasoline in it to ignite the engine. At that point you'll hear a little protracted cough of that ignition. At that point, you know that you've achieved the right mix of gasoline and air in the engine and you're ready to start operation. Therefore, you then have to disengage the choke so that you're opening the butterfly valve so that air and gasoline can get mixed in. So as you're pulling, you listen for that little sound that ignition has occurred and then you disengage the choke and then you start it. Let's listen to a demonstration. We depress the trigger, move the button all the way down to the choked position, and then proceed to pull the starter several times. There, that was the first cough. That means that combustion has occurred in the engine. This is a critical moment. If we leave the engine choked, as we pull the cord, more and more gasoline mist will be blown into the combustion chamber. Gasoline is funny in a way. If there's not enough gasoline, then it won't ignite. If there's too much gasoline and not enough oxygen, it also will not ignite. So it's important that we now flip this lever up to the start position so that when we pull the cord some more air can get in and it will ignite. If we had not released the choke with each pull more and more gasoline mist would have been blown into the combustion chamber and with the choke closed no oxygen would be getting in. At that point the engine 
compartment would be flooded with gasoline and you've got a flooded engine that won't start. The way to correct that problem is to depress the trigger, move the uh, um, switch up to the run position, and then crank it repeatedly. Now, with the uh, switch in the run position, you'll be allowing oxygen in, and with each pull, you'll be expelling some of the uh, oversaturation of gasoline. And eventually, with enough pulls, you have you will have expelled the excess gasoline and you'll be down to the right mixture of oxygen and gasoline and you'll be able to get the chainsaw to start. That breaks the connection so that the electricity being generated by the engine no longer can flow to the spark plug. No spark is created, the combustion stops, and the engine stops. The tasks of ensuring that the gasoline-powered chainsaw is oiled and has its chain sharp and well connected are the same as for a battery-powered or corded electric chainsaw. The two additional tasks you have with a gasoline saw are getting it properly fueled and cleaning the air filter. As stated earlier, there are two reservoirs. The one near the bar is for the oil for the chain, while the one near the rear is for fuel. We also stated that any time you have metal moving against metal, you should have lubrication. This applies to the parts inside the engine as well. In an automobile, you have a reservoir for the engine oil and a system of hoses and channels to move the oil to the engine parts that need to be lubricated. The chainsaw engine is simple enough that a different approach can be taken. The oil to lubricate the engine is mixed right in with the gasoline and distributed with it. The location that most needs lubrication is where the piston rings rub against the sides of the combustion chamber. A tight fit is needed so that the exploding gases do not squeeze out through the gap and are instead forced to push the piston. When the gasoline mist is blown into the combustion chamber, a small amount of oil is also blown in. While the gasoline portion of the mix is burned, much of the oil coats the walls of the chamber, lubricating them. The rest is expelled with the exhaust gases. Obviously, the oil is a special oil, and you should use the oil recommended by your saw manufacturer, and should mix it with the gasoline in the ratio that is recommended. For this saw, the ratio is conveniently in line with the volume of this one gallon container. This small bottle contains just the right amount of oil to mix into this volume of gasoline. You should be aware that in many states, and I don't know if it is all, they add ethanol to the gasoline as an extender. Particularly if your gasoline contains more than 10% ethanol, and particularly if you leave it sitting in a small engine for months on end, it can cause a variety of problems for your engine. That said, I've used it for many years without noticing any problem. Since I became aware of the reports of issues, I've switched to using only ethanol-free gasoline. In my state, some service stations provide ethanol-free gasoline, but only for the more expensive, high-octane gasoline. As your engine is consuming gasoline, it is also consuming an even greater amount of air. You don't want that air to be dirty or contain sawdust, as that could get into the engine. While much of the wood sawdust would burn away, it would still leave ash, and that and the dust would get against the sides of the cylinder and between the ring 
and would gradually wear away the sides of the cylinder, leaving channels for air to escape. You then wouldn't be getting the pressure to drive the piston because some of it would be going between the gap. So it's very important that you have a filter on your saw. All combustion engines have some form of a filter to make sure that the air getting into the combustion chamber is clean. For most saws, the air filter is someplace in the back of the unit like this. And for different saws, unfortunately, there are very different methods of removing the outer case to get to the filter. On this small MS-171, you have to flip this filter down and then the whole casing comes off. Here's the filter. For this mid-sized 271, you actually have to take off some screws here to lift the cover off. For this 044, you have to unscrew and here's the filter. And you can see this one has a good bit of sawdust built up on it. Could be a lot worse. I've usually found that uh, while there may be other and appropriate ways to do it, it's sufficient to take the filter off and use the screwdriver part of the scrunch to knock off the dust. There are much more elaborate ways of cleaning it, such as using a gasoline mix, but uh, I've been doing this approach for decades, and I found that just simply scraping off the dust is sufficient for my use. When you're dealing with a tool that can easily cut through wood, you are also talking about a tool that can easily cut through flesh and bone. So safety is a very important consideration. Rule one, make sure everyone understands that they must not come near you or anyone else who is running a chainsaw. Rule two, don't use a chainsaw while standing on a ladder. Too many bad things can happen. You need two hands on the saw, leaving most of us with no hands to hang on to the ladder. The ladder will be lightweight and could easily be knocked out from under you. You could be injured just from the height of the fall, even if you don't land on your saw and it doesn't land on you. I plan to make a separate video about chainsaw use and ladders. If you feel you really have a situation where you need to use a chainsaw while on a ladder, I hope you can wait until I have a chance to finish that video so you can see it before setting up your ladder. Rule 3. If you can afford it, definitely buy a set of chainsaw safety chaps and use them whenever you use your chainsaw. These pants contain a thick layer of very strong, long Kevlar fibers. As soon as the saw starts to cut into the chaps, these fibers are pulled into the saw, jamming it very quickly, ideally before the teeth of the chain can make it through the chaps to your leg. The prices vary from around $45 to around $100 for professional chaps. Rule 4. If you can afford it, buy a hard hat with the face shield. If you're going to get a gasoline powered chainsaw, make sure it includes built on hearing protectors. While you may not have any risk of something falling on your head, the hard hat and face mask may provide protection from a very dangerous form of kickback. In this particular form of kickback, the end of the saw contacts something unintended, causing the end of the saw to jump strongly upwards, pivoting about the mass of the saw and your grip. 
In the worst case, the bar and spinning chain may pivot all the way up to contact your head or face. This happened to a young engineer I worked with years ago. He came to work after the weekend with a big bandage on his forehead. A hard hat would probably have prevented the injury. With or without a hard hat, you should be very careful to pay attention to where the end of your saw is when you are cutting, making sure it doesn't grab anything and come after you. A good hard hat with hearing protectors will run you around $30 to $55. Rule 5. If you are going to cut down a tree that is more than 5 inches in diameter, learn and understand the proper ways to do it. Such trees can weigh a few hundred pounds, while big trees can weigh several tons. There are a good number of high-quality educational videos on YouTube that cover the appropriate methods to use. I would recommend you view the series I have produced if you have not already watched them. View enough videos from whatever source so that you feel comfortable you have found ones that cover the situation you are dealing with. Rule 6. If you think you will have to pull the tree down as part of the process of cutting it down, make sure you have a reliable plan for the pulling. Getting a friend or two to tug on a rope may prove entirely inadequate. Again, I recommend viewing my videos about pulling trees down. One of the most common non-hazardous problems novice chainsaw users have is getting their saw pinched in the cut they are making. The strength of the pinch increases as the diameter of the wood increases. The pinch can be so strong that no one will be able to pull the chainsaw out, or if they can, the chain will get snapped in the process. The easiest way to avoid this problem is to understand where pinching is likely to occur and avoid cutting in those locations. This space cut by the saw is technically referred to as the kerf. If you are cutting where pinching may be a problem, you should watch the width of the, of the kerf closely. If you see it starting to close, it is time to get your chainsaw out of there. Anytime the wood is under a bending force, there is a chance of your saw getting pinched. There are four cases you should be aware of. Probably the most common is the case where the wood is sagging between two points. This downed hickory is supported on a log on this end, and up on the other end, it's hung up on that stub, that big stub of the dead pine tree. So this log in between is sagging between that point and the tree. So we can expect that it will try to pinch from the top. So let's do a demonstration of getting a saw stuck in a log. Watch right here for the kerf closing At this point, the saw is pretty well stuck. So we could really tug on it and break the chain, or we could get another saw to free it. If you don't have another saw handy, then you might have to jack the log up because this is really in there. Fortunately, I do happen to have another saw handy. We're not going to want to cut right next to it because then we'd have two saws stuck. So what we'll want to do is move up from it and cut from the bottom up so that it will open up on the bottom where we're cutting from. As a side note, you should probably put some form of blocking under the trunk before you sever it. Something like a round that you've already cut. 
There are three good reasons for this. The first is simple convenience. You want the log to still be up off of the ground so that when you cut it, your saw isn't going to go into the ground. The second is for protection of your chainsaw. As the log carries it down, the bar might get bent, a tooth might get broken, or something bad could happen to your saw because that, that uh, log going down can still have the chainsaw fairly well held. So you want to get blocking under the trunk. The third reason is rare but can happen and that is that once you've cut it the log still ends up on a high spot on this end and a high spot on that end so it's still got a sag and you're still faced with the problem of trying to cut through something that's going to pinch you. So a good idea to put a log or a, a, a uh, round under the trunk to keep it off of the ground once it's severed. Another thing you should watch out for is sprung branches such as this one. When the tree fell, this branch slid down this tree and was bent. So it has a tendency to try and go that way. When you see a sprung branch like this, always cut it from the side away from where it's going to spring. Otherwise, you could end up with a nasty bruise on your face. This situation is a bit trickier. Obviously, if I try to make a cut here, this part of the trunk wants to go down. However, if you recall, this part of the tree is hung up over that uh, big stub on the pine, and as a result, most of the weight is on the other side of that stub. So this part of the tree actually wants to go up when I release it from this part. So a key point is if you cut on a diagonal or even straight down, this part will be trying to move down, this part will try to be move up. So you can't do a cut like that because then they'll just bump into each other. You have to do the cut the other way around so that one will be able to fall away from the other. So that's an important point to remember is if the tree wants to go opposite directions you have to make your cut on a little bit of a diagonal so the two pieces can fall away from each other. The simple case is when your branch is supported on one end as a cantilever. In this instance, the kerf will open up as you cut, and then when the branch gets thin enough, it will fall away. that I said branch. If you have a leaning tree, that's an entirely different matter and can be a very dangerous situation. If uh, you have a tree that's leaning and you cut it, you could have what's called a barber chair incident, and these can be very dangerous. Before you even think about cutting down a tree with a lot of lean any direction, you should watch a good video on leaners and barber chairing. I have some in my series, but there are others. But make sure you study those before you even think of cutting down a leaning tree. The fourth case of pinching is fairly rare, but I have noticed that with some live or recently live trees, there may be some locked-in compression stress. And as you're trying to cut them down, whether they're vertically or horizontally oriented, the wood may start to expand because of those locked-in stresses. I've noticed this 
primarily with pine trees, large pine trees, where as you make the cut, the wood actually starts to compress in towards that cut. Um, the easiest way to deal with this, if you see the uh, wood starting to close on your saw, is abandon that cut and start another one close to it. Um, that way the stress will already have expanded into the crack and you'll be cutting a new one that's not under stress. So that's rare, but it is something to be aware of. If you do get to the point of cutting down a tree and you've never done so before, please study the situation carefully before you do it and learn what the appropriate techniques are. There are numerous things that could go seriously wrong. There are a number of good videos available on the proper techniques. The basic felling process consists of making two cuts to create a notch on the side in the direction you want the tree to fall and then making a cut on the opposite side of the tree. That last cut is called the back cut. The area of the trunk between your notch and your back cut is the hinge. This portion of wood has a relatively narrow width between your notch and your back cut, but it is almost as long as the width of the trunk. The hinge bends easily across its narrow width, but it is strong against bending in its long direction. This is why it can be effective at preventing the tree from falling sideways. When things go badly, the inexperienced chainsaw user has usually made one of two mistakes. One is thinking that cutting the wedge will determine which direction the tree is going to fall. This is not true if the tree is leaning the other direction. If it is, or sometimes even if it appears to be vertical, some method of pulling the tree in the right direction is needed possibly using wedges in the back cut to drive it that way, but it's preferable to get something up there to make sure you're pulling it in that direction. Please be sure to see my video on pulling the tree down with ropes to learn about the methods that may or may not be reasonable to use. The second most common mistake inexperienced homeowners make is not appreciating how absolutely critical it is to preserve that hinge. The typical response when the tree hasn't fallen is to cut more of the hinge and you can't do that. If you cut too much of the hinge you'll lose control of the direction of the fall and the tree could fall sideways. So once you've uh, got the hinge to the appropriate size, don't do any more cutting. At that point, what you need to do is make sure that the fall has started to occur. Once it has started to occur, then you can try to chase it, but you're better off leaving the scene and letting it go down. Well, those are some of the basics about chainsaws, their use, and care. I hope you found this interesting and maybe even helpful.